Okay. Well, I don't. This kind of like uh, Star Trek classroom is throwing me for a loop. But <laughs> like, where am I supposed to put something? Um, anyway, uh, um, so this philosophy one hundred Z empiricists. I'm Abe Stone, you can call me Abe or Professor Stone. Can people hear me back there? Okay, all right, good. Um, so uh, I was going to, I was going to pass out hard copies of the syllabus, which is what I usually do, but the printer and the Cal Annex pretty much went belly up. So I have no hard copies of the syllabus. Um, uh, but nevertheless, what I'm going to do is go through what it says in the syllabus and then give a hopefully kind of brief introduction to the course. In the past, it ended up often not being that brief. So. <laughs> But I'm, I'm hoping to get out early today. <laughs> so we'll see. Um, so uh, since I can't pass out the syllabus, I can tell you where to find this. Um, I mean, you should, did people get the email I sent yesterday? Okay, so you already have the link there. You know. All right, I'm going to let it um, Okay. Um, Oh, and I see uh, Kelvin and Chelsea are there in Zoom land. Um, okay. Um, right, so I'm just going to start by going through what it says here. Um, I said, I mean, still the best way to reach me is by email. Um, but I'm also going to try to get this thing called Notify Abe working. I'm not sure it still works. Uh, I set it up with Google Apps a long time ago. Um, it's basically like a thing where you can send a push notification to my phone and send us a, a very short text message with it. So like if, I, if you're sending me email and it's urgent and I'm not responding. When I, when I set this up, it was because I used to like be, be very bad about responding to email, but now I'm, I'm much better. So, probably shouldn't need to use this, but um, it's there. There's a, there's a link to it. Um, um, oh, I should have, I forgot to mention this in my other course, that my office hours are, de are to be determined. <laughs> um, I guess I just say to be, de to be determined or by appointment. <laughs> um, I'm, you know, like I'm going to, Fix the office hours soon. If you need to see me before that, you can let me know, and you know we'll find a time to meet. Um, presently, I'm planning to have the office hours only via Zoom. In the fall, I had in-person office hours as well as Zoom office hours, and no one ever came to the in-person office hour. So, uh, um, but I think uh, after the chaos of these first couple of weeks has died down. I probably will be, you know, cause both my courses I'm teaching are in the evening. I'll probably be arriving in Santa Cruz like early in the afternoon. So if you want to meet me in person, that's definitely possible. Um, just let me know. Um, and uh, so, yeah, as I said, our two teaching assistants, um, uh, Calvin Viegas and Chelsea Chu, I guess. I, I don't know if I've ever said your last name, Chelsea. <laughs> but anyway, um, they're they're both with us in Zoom land. Um, uh, Kelvin is, lives in St. Louis now, so he's not going to be here in person, and his set, his discussion sections are going to be over Zoom. Um, Chelsea is here, and her discussion sections will be in person, but she can't make it to the lecture, so she's going to be attending by Zoom. 
Um, um, and as I think I said in my email, I don't know why there's an asterisk there. Anyway, as I think I said in my email, you know, if you, uh, this I guess goes especially for those people who are in Zoom land right now, that if you want a Zoom section and you're assigned to an in-person section or vice versa, you know, like contact the TAs and we'll see, it, it shouldn't be a problem, I think, to switch. I mean, it's really hard to officially switch someone from one section to another. You have to like unenroll from the course and re-enroll whatever, but it's really easy to just tell the TAs, I'm gonna go to this section. <laughs> right. Um, okay. Um, modality. So uh, this is also something I said in my email, but I repeat it. Now, so like with some exceptions, most of which are in the next two weeks, <laughs> I'm gonna be lecturing here in person and I definitely hope that people will come to the in-person lecture. I don't wanna be in this big room talk to no one. Um, but if you can't or you don't want to, uh, I'm also gonna uh, stream all the lectures on Zoom and you know, I forgot to press record. Oh no, no I didn't. Oh, I am recording. Okay, sorry. Um, and I'm also going to record all the lectures and put them up on YouTube. Um, you know, because the, my courses are late, that's probably not going to happen until the following morning. I'm not going to. I live in Berkeley. That's part of the issue. So when I get home, I'm not going to feel like like uploading lectures to YouTube or anything else. But. Um, um, but they should appear soon the next day. Um, and uh, right, so that's the regular status, but then because of um, Jewish holidays, there's times that I won't um, be able to make it, as I said, mostly in the next two weeks. So, I mean, it's, it says in detail on the syllabus what's gonna happen, but basically like, Next week, so Thursday, there will be no lecture. There'll be a lecture on Monday at an unusual time um, via Zoom only. If you can't come to that time, you can watch the recording. Um, and I think Tuesday will also be via Zoom only at a different time. Um, that will most that problem will mostly die down. Um, it's just for the first couple of weeks and once more towards the end of May. Um, okay. Um, any questions about that so far? All right. Um, course requirements. So first of all, it says participation in discussion sections. Um, so participation in discussion sections is a course requirement. However, it's not like, so this is how it affects your grade. If, you, if you're if you a good, I asked the TAs at the end of the quarter to give me a list of people who are good participants in discussion sections. And if someone's on that list and their grade is like near a borderline, then I bump it up. So, and there, there usually are a fair number of grades near a borderline. So this actually has an effect. <laughs> um, uh, but it does mean that although it's a course requirement, you could, you know, get an A in the course and never participate in section, right? So it's like not, it's not going to penalize you, but it could help you. Um, um, also, like participation doesn't mean attendance. Now, of course, you can't participate if you don't ever attend, <laughs> obviously, but, uh, but, uh, um, you could be a good participant participant in section, even though you don't show up every single time, right? So it's not really about like the t I'm not going to take attendance in lectures. The TAs are not going to take attendance, but but they are going to notice who participates. That's so that's what that uh, 
requirement is about. It, the next paragraph says attendance at lectures is not required, but is highly recommended. So like I said, I'm not taking attendance. Um, no one ever took attendance at lectures when I was in college. It seems like a high school thing to me. I don't know. <laughs> um, so, but um, I hope you come because like, you know, you're paying me to, <laughs> to give you lectures. <laughs> So you may as well listen to them, even if they're not that good sometimes. Um, so, uh, but um, again, like if you can't or don't want to make it, I, the recordings will be uh, available. Um, okay, so the the next thing, I don't know why I called it this. Well, maybe I kind of remember, but it's why they're called metaphysics exercises. It's not really a good name for them now, but <laughs> um, the, so um, the metaphysics exercises are a kind of uh, like quiz. I mean, it's not timed, right? But it's like a, a kind of quiz. Now I do it through Canvas. Um, it's like three multiple choice questions. Um, each one of them is... <laughs> Each one of them is three multiple choice questions. Um, the questions are about uh, the reading that I've already lectured on, right? So that is you do the reading and you could listen to the lecture and then you answer these three multiple choice questions. There isn't one, there's I think like 10 of them for the whole quarter. That like some weeks there are none. There's none towards the beginning of the course. The, the first one's not due for a couple of weeks from now. Um, some weeks there are none. Some weeks there are two. Some weeks there's only one. Um, each one of them is not worth very much. Uh, but all put together, they're worth thirty percent of the grade. So you should like you should do them, <laughs> especially like there's no penalty for guessing or anything. So even if you don't know the answer, you, you know you could still get some points that way. Um, the way they're going to be graded though is, as it says here, heavily on a curve. I mean, I, I don't actually try to fit it to a normal distribution or something like that, but it's on a curve in the sense that, you know. Um, at the end of the quarter, I look at the distribution of like, I, you know, everyone gets one point for every correct answer, basically. And I look at the distribution of total number of points and like, um, I try to make the grades on it similar to the paper grades, which means that the most common grades will be A minus and B plus, basically. So these questions, however, tend to be kind of difficult. I've been trying to make them easier actually for years, <laughs> but they're still kind of difficult. So um, what that ends up meaning is that like, um, oftentimes you, you're like only getting half of them right and you might be getting an A minus. <laughs> Right, so, um, and I don't think anyone has ever failed the metaphysics exercises except by just not doing any of them, which you shouldn't do. You should do, so you should do some of them <laughs> for that obvious reason. Um, so, um, so I'm saying that, I, I mean, I know even though I'm saying it now, I'm still gonna get like a panic email in the middle of the quarter. Or I'm failing the, the metaphysics exercises. No, you're not failing those exercises. You're probably getting like, if you're really find, finding a hard time, you're probably getting a B plus, you know? <laughs> so, um, uh, um, and like the intent of those basically is, it's not like to test whether you did the reading because that, that was like, it's not enough for that. And also, like it would be easy to design questions that test whether you did the reading. Like I remember when I was in high school, I had a course where we read Paradise Lost. And after Paradise Lost, we had a test and like it had like an angel identification section. <laughs> There's like a list of angels that you had to like, I mean, that's the kind of question you ask if you want to tell if someone did a reading, I guess, you know, uh, not very interesting. The, the the point of these questions is to get you to like focus on 
interpretation of the reading, like try to, um, especially like try to keep terminology straight because students um, in this kind of philosophy, the reading, the reading in this course anyway, technical terminology is really important. Like idea is an important technical term that's gonna go on from one end of the quarter to the other. And yet it's an everyday word that we use for all kinds of stuff. And it's really, important to focus on what the philosophers are actually using it for. So like that's what that's basically what these questions are about. Then there's there's two short papers. Um, these assignments are already up. So you you know um, if you at the online syllabus there's a link to them. You can see what they are. Both of the short papers are like kind of um, like very specific exercises in interpreting the text essentially. And then there's a final paper, which is a, you know, more like open-ended, write a paper about stuff we read in the course. <laughs> um, and for that, there's suggested topics, so they don't have to write about the suggested topics. And the suggested topics have a lot of kind of sub-suggestions, like if you write about this, you know, you could ask this, you could ask this, you could ask this. It's basically like to try to get you to come up with your own um, thesis that you want to argue for in your paper. Um, and uh, because this is a disciplinary communication course, I feel like I'm very disconcerted by this setup. I think there's like in the in the video, in the recording, you're going to see my ear a lot. <laughs> so there should be like a lectern here, right? But only that. <laughs> Whatever that is. All right. Anyway, I'm sorry. Um, right. So this is a disciplinary communication course. So like um, we're supposed to like have you write drafts of the final paper or something. I don't know how to make that work because in t like a 10 week course, you know, uh, you would have to write about the first thing we read to start writing drafts, time, you know. So uh, instead of that, what there is is an assignment where one week before the final paper is due, you're supposed to hand in a draft of the first paragraph and an outline of the rest of the paper. And I mean, you won't be held to, you don't have to use that first paragraph or follow that outline. But the idea is to get some feedback from the TA and your fellow students that might like help you uh, produce a better final paper. Um, one reason I thought of doing this is that I, I've often seen philosophy papers where like I get to the end and there's a sentence in the last paragraph, and I'm like, that should have been the thesis. <laughs> that would have been a good paper, <laughs> right? So, like, just to to think about the paper on a broad scale, a structure, or whatever. That's the idea behind this. Um, they'll and the TAs will organize special sections for this purpose at the end of the course because uh, I think this assignment will be after some of the sections have met for the last time anyway. Um, and the the way that assignment affects your grade is that um, if you don't hand it in at all, or if you hand in something and what it says in the syllabus is wholly unsatisfactory, that's supposed to be a very low bar, <laughs> right? So basically, if you hand in something that actually is a paragraph and an outline, <laughs> whether they're any good or not, um, then nothing happens. But if you don't, then uh, your final paper grade will be reduced one step. So like from A to A minus or whatever. So that's just to give you an incentive to actually do it, basically. Um, uh, and again, like, uh, you know, this this shouldn't happen to you, right? Because you like all you have to do is write any kind of paragraph, you know, that looks like an introductory paragraph, an outline. It doesn't have to be good, <laughs> and hand it in, and and you know it won't then it won't affect your grade. Um, uh, 
Let's see, the paper assignments are available online. You can find some answers to frequently asked questions in my frequently asked questions. Um, please do not plagiarize. I used to just I, I usually just say, please do not plagiarize at the beginning of the class. And I'm not going to say a lot more than that now, but there has, seems to have been more of it recently. I don't know if that's really, that's my impression. Um, and it's just really annoying and bad. So please don't do it. Um, and like, uh, I mean, uh, Although there's no guarantee that this will never happen in the future, uh, as as we'll know at the end of the course when we read Hume, um, <laughs> there's no guarantee that this will never happen in the future. In the past, I have never failed a paper that someone actually handed in, except because they were plagiarizing. <laughs> so it's better to hand in a paper that's not that great. You know, which I mean, one way to hand in a paper that's really not very great would be to like quote whatever it is, you know, like Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy or whatever, just put it all in quotes and have a footnote. <laughs> then it's not a very good paper, right? Obviously, a good paper should have your own original work in it, but it's not plagiarizing, plagiarism, and you won't fail, right? So, I mean, and and please don't have Chat GPT write your paper. <laughs> okay, I feel like I've spent enough time with chat GPT that I would know even without using the detector. Like I know what it says. Overall, that I shouldn't have said that. Now you'll just delete that word. But anyway, <laughs> um, right. Um, and finally, all assignments are due by 11.55 p.m. on the due date. The only reason I put that there is I, I used to just say that the time it's due on this day and they didn't want to ask me what time it's due. So. I'm like I don't know, 11:55 p.m. <laughs> but the, uh, but I'm I'm actually like I'm not watching with a stopwatch to see you know like don't send me an email saying oh my god my paper was three minutes late what's gonna <laughs> I don't care all right uh, okay um, are there any questions about the course requirements okay. Um, Text. This is pretty straightforward. Um, I hope everyone who wants to has been able to buy these books. Um, there are also are free alternatives that there are links to on the syllabus. Should have you know? Why didn't I put a link there? There's a website called uh, DavidHume.org, I think, that has all his works. But anyway, never mind that. So there's various free alternatives and also uh, um, audio free audiobooks if you prefer to consume them that way. Um, that's what I'm going to be listening to in the car on my way to Santa Cruz. <laughs> uh, so uh, um, but uh, the advantage of having the editions that I ordered, which are not very expensive editions, is that you know I might refer to page numbers in my lecture, and if you want to find it, that would be convenient to have that edition. But all the none of the assignments are by page number; they're all by like chapter and section number. Oh, by the way, this this symbol means section. Um, and two of them means sections, right? Just like one P means page and two P means pages, two of them mean sections. All right. Um, well, on this, well, of course, nowadays you could ask, this is something you could ask chat, chat GPT. Like, suppose you're not sure about Roman numerals, you could just ask chat GPT. Actually, you could just ask Google. Really. All right, anyway, sorry. Um, uh, okay, I believe that is all the administrative st type stuff that I have to talk about. Are there any questions about that before I go on to the content? Okay. Um, <laughs> 
be. Oh, I should have mentioned office hours. That's what I forgot. Oh, I did. A, oh, wait, I did mention my office hours, right. The TAs are also have office hours, but their office hours are by appointment. Um, um, so uh, if you want to talk, still make an appointment. <laughs> um, okay. Um, and that's obviously because like a lot of times you have office hour and no one comes. <laughs> so um, I'm okay with that, but I'm, you know, CA shouldn't have to, to deal with that if you want. <laughs> All right. Um, okay, so this course, empiricist, um, Um, it's right part of our required history of philosophy sequence. Um, and well, so there's 100A, which is Eatman. And then there's 100B, which is Rationalist. And 100C, which is um, so a couple things about this. First of all, uh, if I were to draw the history of philosophy, and by which I mean the history of Western philosophy, if I were to draw the history of Western philosophy, um, like here's uh, 100 BC approximately, and here's 2000 approximately. So there's like, um, So, you know, Aristotle died somewhere around here. And Descartes' meditations were written somewhere around here. <laughs> so, most of the history of philosophy happened in between. <laughs> now, I mean, I know that when John teaches 100A, he doesn't stop with the death of Aristotle. He goes, you know, up to here. <laughs> so it's not quite as bad as that. But it's still pretty bad. <laughs> um, so uh, when I teach 100B, which I haven't for years now, but I hope to do it again sometime soon. When I teach 100B, um, I actually start by reading some of the stuff that happened in between just like for like a week and a half. Um, but I'm not doing that here, but I am going to say something about it. And the thing I'm going to say about it is by way of explaining why these courses, so these courses are both have to do with the period of philosophy that we call early modern philosophy. Um, Um, early modern philosophy begins, depending on account, I mean, with Descartes, some people would say maybe it begins with Machiavelli, um, but somewhere around there. Um, and it ends in 1781 with the publication of the Critique of the Early Modern. Like five times. Right, and after that is like modern, modern philosophy. <laughs> um, 
so um, this is the period we're talking about. And the question I'm gonna ask is like, why are our why are these our two forces about it? Um, so, okay, so what happened in this in-between period? And the answer is that for most of this time, people were, um, they were basically Aristotelians. Now, that wasn't true, again, it's unfortunate I didn't space these either, I mean, it's kind of weird, but um, that wasn't true right after Aristotle's death. It wasn't true for maybe like uh, 300 years or so, give or take, after Aristotle's death. Um, you know, uh, people read Aristotle, Arist we were interested in Aristotle, but Aristotle didn't dominate philosophy. That started a little bit later. It started in the period we call late antiquity. Um, and um, in late antiquity, there were two schools so one, the people who call themselves peripatetics saw themselves as Aristotelians. The other who, who were the ones who called themselves Platonists, although we call them Neoplatonists. What, right? So one reason we call them Neoplatonists is that their Plato had a lot of Aristotle. <laughs> um, and they wrote long commentaries on Aristotle, really long in some cases. Um, um, uh, this was all, almost all in Greek. Cicero, famously, Seneca, some people wrote philosophy in Latin, but most philosophy was written in Greek for the first thousand years or so. <laughs> um, uh, and then, you know, there was the fall of Rome and the Dark Ages. <laughs> Um, and for a while, like nothing was going on anywhere, ever. It, like in the terms of the tradition of Western philosophy. I mean, of course, they were writing philosophy in China, but that's not what I thought. Like, like nothing was going on anywhere. Philosophy kind of first picked up again in Arabic in Baghdad, and those people, the 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 people who kind of were the key chain in the trend. Uh, in transmission were the Christian peripatetics of Baghdad. It was a school of Christian peripatetics, Aristotelians, and the early um, Muslim and Jewish philosophers of the Arabic speaking world like received the Aristotelian tradition from them, basically. Um, there still wasn't much going on in the Latin West, right, in Europe. It was um, like, I mean, this is the time we call the Dark Ages. <laughs> so like things didn't really start to pick up in the Latin West until like the 13th century, 12th, 13th century around there. Um, and it started with people actually translating um, Aristotle and his commentators from Arabic into Latin in um, in Muslim Spain. Um, later, not much later, they started to get the uh, translations directly from Greek from Byzantium, right? So, like in Byzantium, they you know they can they continue to speak Greek and read Greek and. They started around the same time, maybe a little earlier, writing or philosophy and Greek themselves, but uh, the, the, um, one of the Crusades, I think it's the Fourth Crusade, one of the Crusades, like they were on their way to the, conquer the Holy Land and they stopped in Constantinople and they said, hey, why don't we conquer this instead? <laughs> so they conquered the Byzantine Empire and there was like Latin rule in the Byzantine Empire for I think like 70 years. Then eventually the Byzantines managed to rally in the provinces and take them out. Um, but in that time, um, that that was the time, it was, it was during the lifetime of Thomas Aquinas. And during that time, um, William of Merbeck was living in Constantinople and, and like 
getting access to all the Greek manuscripts of Aristotle and his commentators and translating them into Latin and sending them back to Rome. Um, so, right, so after that, um, philosophy um, uh, well, I mean, so there was philosophy written in Arabic after that also. Um, it was kind of cut off from what happened later in Europe. I think more in um, the Shiite tradition, especially, um, people continued to, to read Avicenna and write in Aristotle in Arabic and write commentaries and so forth. But um, at least for our purposes, because this is what we're heading for, early modern philosophy in Europe. <laughs> um, you can think of philosophy as kind of switching to Latin at that point. So it was like Greek, Arabic, Latin. But throughout this whole long period, as it switched from one language to another, everyone was still Aristotelian. Now, um, what does it mean that everyone is Aristotelian? Well, it means they all agreed that Aristotle was pretty much right. Not necessarily right about everything. In fact, there were kind of traditional places where people would disagree with Aristotle, like about the eternity of the world or whatever. But, um, but even when you said Aristotle was wrong, it couldn't be a stupid mistake. Right? Like you really have to explain what Aristotle was thinking and why it made a lot of sense, but it's wrong because, but for the most part, you would say that Aristotle was right. So everyone agreed that Aristotle was right about most things, but they didn't agree with each other about what Aristotle meant. So during this whole period, um, and I'm uh, I probably shouldn't have to say that all of this is an oversimplification. There were anti-Aristotelians in this period, whatever. But generally speaking, during this whole period, people would argue with each other, and they would be arguing both about what's true, like what's the true theory of the world or whatever, and about what Aristotle meant. And the two would line up with each other. So you would say, like, I agree with Aristotle that X, and here's why. And your opponent would say, I agree with Aristotle that not X and here's why. <laughs> right? So they both try to prove that you were wrong and that you didn't understand Aristotle right. <laughs> um, that's that's the way um, a really strong philosophical tradition works. Um, are we entirely unlike that now? This is, I was talking about this same thing in 112 before I came here. No, not really. Of course, we still have our texts that, I mean, depending on who you are, the texts will be different. You know, it might be David Lewis. It's, it's, there's, there's something where you get points for finding a good interpretation that makes sense of that text. Right? Um, so, um, but in any case, that's what was going on here. Um, and what changed was Descartes or around that time, um, but Descartes was pretty important in this process, even if it wasn't like him single-handedly, he was pretty important. Um, what changed around that time was that um, everyone became anti-Aristotelian, <laughs> right? So, that means they still didn't agree with each other about most things, but now they agreed that Aristotle was well right. <laughs> Any question? Yeah. Uh, can I give an example? Well, it meant that, I mean, that, that was trying to describe, so I'm trying to describe it in abstract. To give an example is hard because I, I like that's that's exactly what I try to do at the beginning of 100B, like go through an actual example of what Aristotle says and how Plotinus understood it and how you know. So like you have to get into details to give an example, but but the way again the way it works in general is you you know. I mean, there's different versions of it. Like so, for example, Avicenna doesn't very often actually say Aristotle says X. 
usually he just writes something that if you know your Aristotle, which of course you would, right? You you know what passage in Aristotle he's interpreting, and if you pay careful attention to the way what he says, like what words he puts in that aren't actually in Aristotle, you can see how he's interpreting it, <laughs> right? As opposed to other people like Thomas Aquinas will, and in fact Avicenna, the the you know. He's most likely to say Aristotle says at a point where it's something that that you can't find in Aristotle. <laughs> then you know, then to emphasize that no, I really think this is Aristotle's view. He'll say Aristotle says, right. Whereas like Thomas Aquinas, for example, will you know will say like, um, um, you might think not X because blah blah blah. But against this, the philosopher says in the book, book eight of the metaphysics, so and so, right? So now you know that that like, um, not X is the wrong answer because it's against the philosopher. <laughs> and then Thomas will give his explanation of why, right? So in the end, so this and like these earlier people mostly were writing commentaries on Aristotle. So it's, again, it's a different way of looking at it, right? That they'll, you know. Um, they'll quote a piece of Aristotle and there'll be a long discussion of why it's right. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so it works different ways, but I don't know. I hope that's helpful. Um, um, so, all right, what I was starting to say is, so they... Um, They don't agree about a lot of things, but they agree. They what they do agree is that Aristotle um, is wrong. <laughs> and one of the things they agree they agree that Aristotle is wrong about um, is about epistemology. So epistemology is not a, even though it's obviously it comes from Greek, well, maybe it's not obvious to you, but anyway, there's that Greek roots in it, right? Episteme means knowledge or science. Um, even though this is like more from Greek roots, it's not an ancient word. It's not even, doesn't even go back to the early modern period. It was first introduced in the 19th century, but it's the word for what I'm talking about, so it. So right, so epistemology is the you know philosophical study of knowledge, meaning what like what we can know if anything, right? Because it's always there's always this threat, or some people don't see it as a, some people see it as a promise. But anyway, <laughs> there's always this possibility that we don't know anything. <laughs> but so what if anything we can know and how how we can know it. That's what epistemology is about. It, it typically goes together with this other branch or area or like um, aspect of philosophy, of metaphysics, or at least this is one of the many things people have called metaphysics. <laughs> um, metaphysics is an ancient word. Um, but in any case, uh, like, what I'm going to use it to use to mean here, and what people usually use it for these days anyway, is it's the philosophical study of like what things there are and the why, like what causes they have, things like that in general. Right? So, you know, are there bodies? Are there spirits? Does, does God exist? Or, you know, like all those, those are questions of metaphysics. These things um, should go together. Right? I mean, they should go together both ways, both in the sense that, like, um, um, if I claim to know something about what kind of things exist and why, um, then my epistemology better explain how it's possible for me to know something. 
right? So they so so um, so the epistemology should fit the metaphysics of that. But on the other hand, if my epistemology says I can know the following things in the following ways, the metaphysics better explain how it is that I can interact with those things that I'm saying I can know about. Right? Um, so, uh, right, like, if I say I can know things about the world by seeing it, then I bet that it's better explain how it's possible for, like, um, whatever kind of thing I am, which the metaphysicist is going to have to say, are you a spirit, are you a body, to be affected by light, what, what's that, you know, et cetera. Um, okay, yeah, question? What was it that made people switch and start not believing in that? <sighs> that's, you know, that's a, <laughs> that's a very difficult question. Um, and... Um, I mean, a lot of things happened around the same time, like the Reformation, like Galileo, like, um, uh, um, so it's hard to know what comes first or what, you know, so, um, um, like the end of the Middle Ages, whatever that means. <laughs> Right, like the Renaissance. In this story, I left out the Renaissance. Oh yeah, there's like a Renaissance. <laughs> right. So, um, the, you know, the, the, well, no, I shouldn't get diverted talking about the Renaissance philosophy. But anyway, yeah. So it's a really hard question to answer. Um, I mean, which means what? I mean, it really means we don't know the answer, right? Like this is something you have to be careful with historians, and I, I'm not a historian. I mean, I, you know, I teach history of philosophy and I read a lot of stuff from different theories of history of philosophy, but I'm, I'm not really a historian. Like if I need to know the dates that people lived, I, I looked them up on Wikipedia and I, I copied them like, right? So, I mean, um, but like, but when you read historians, like it's part of the professional demeanor of historians to, to like, one answer or the other has to be right. And you like, um, you know, moreover, it has to be different from the one that the previous generation of historians said was right, or else his, historians wouldn't continue to exist. So, <laughs> so you, you know, um, you weigh factors on both sides and then you say, and so it's definitely this. <laughs> But like in real life, you know, we we just we don't know the answers to a lot of questions. Especially when it comes to ancient philosophy. I mean, we barely know that these people actually existed, right? Like we have like you know, like Socrates, let's say. You know, Socrates is I mean, I'm not saying Socrates didn't exist, but there's like three independent records of his existence, and that's it. <laughs> Right, there's like Plato, Xenophon, and Aristophanes, and that's it. Everything else is copied from those. <laughs> so it's not like a modern figure where you can, you know, like there's newspaper articles about him and a birth certificate, correspondence, and all, you know. So anyway, so like a question like this, um, I, I I doubt you know I. I I doubt that anyone really knows or could know exactly why. But okay, anyway, sorry, that was probably more than I should have said about that. Um, what I what I wanted I wanted to get back to my own oversimplified version of history, so, um, and say that okay, right. So these two things should go together. Sometimes one comes first, and sometimes the other comes first. In this period, usually the epistemology comes first. Um, and as I, I was starting to say, one of these things, the things these people agreed that Aristotle was wrong about is epistemology. So what Aristotle said was that in order for human beings to have knowledge, we need two powers or faculties, sense and reason or intellect. <laughs> Sorry. 
It's only by putting these two together that we learn things about the world. Um, and the early modern philosophers all agree that you don't need both of these. Only they disagree about which one you need. <laughs> right? So the rationalists, as you can tell from the name, think that our knowledge of the world is only based on reason not on the senses. That's kind of the weirder one for, I think, for contemporary people to, to understand why someone would say, fortunately, that's 100 B, so I don't have to justify that in this course. But, um, uh, you know, I mean, of course, like they know we have senses, but they, and, and they're good for something, but what they're not good for is finding out what the world is really like, according to the rationalists. Um, and the empiricists are the people who say that all our knowledge of the world is based on sense. And again, of course, they know we have reason and it's good for something, but it's not good for originating knowledge. It's only for like deducing one piece of knowledge from another or something like that. Um, So this is a real division that, that, that people in this period actually disagreed about. Um, but of course, there were a lot of other divisions and other things that they talked about and disagreed about, and things besides metaphysics and epistemology. What else is there besides metaphysics and epistemology? Well, um, yeah, I'm going to say this now. So these are parts of what's called theoretical philosophy. Theoretic, a, a theoretical question, this is not the way we, we usually word, use the word theoretical now, so you have to pay attention. A theoretical question is a question about what is true, right? Like you're asking for knowledge. You want to know something. That's a theoretical question. What other kind of question is there? Well, and this terminology is, is goes back to Aristotle. The other kind of question, or at least one other kind of question, is a practical question. And the question is, what should I do? Now, those, these two types of questions are related to each other, but they're not the same type of question. Right, like if I want to know what I should do, like let's say I want to know, should I build a bridge across the Atlantic? So for some reason I always use this example. Should I use a bridge, build a bridge across the Atlantic? Um, so, um, so. Like, first of all, the, the way we use theoretical and practical now, you might say something like, well, in theory, that would be good, but it wouldn't be practical. But when you say that, what you really just mean is the theory isn't a very good theory, right? Like the theory didn't take into account like how much it would cost, like how dangerous it would be to cross it, like all the stuff like that, right? So it's like not a very good theory. But this distinction is not that is not a distinction like that at all. It's a distinction between two, two completely different questions. So, so, so the distinction is here. Like the theoretical questions would be, how much would it cost to build a bridge across the Atlantic? You know, um, what what would it? You know, how much freight could you bring across it every day, et cetera, et cetera? Uh, what would happen in a storm? You know, and then. But like none of that tells you whether you should build it. You still have to decide whether you should build it. You're going to use this information, but this is a different question. At least that's the way we think about it. We make it a question of theoretical and practical questions. <laughs> um, like everything else in philosophy, some philosophers would reject that distinction. You know, but 
Um, uh, but um, not the people we're talking about in this course. So, this, right, so there's this fundamental distinction between theoretical and practical philosophy. Theoretical philosophy is metaphysics and epistemology and maybe some other stuff like that. And um, practical philosophy is ethics and politics, where by politics, of course, I mean political philosophy, right? Not like running for office. <laughs> right. So, um, so like the people that we read in these two courses also wrote about this. And they also wrote about all kinds of other issues in metaphysics and epistemology. Why do we have them divided up according to this scheme in particular? So the answer basically is that this is Kant's division of his categories. At least his division of his predecessors, the predecessors to his theoretical philosophy. Because the whole basis of Kant's the theoretical philosophy was to go back to a version of this and say that we need both sense and reason. There are two sources of knowledge, sense and understanding. Understanding is the same word as intellect, believe it or not, even though they don't, they're not spelled the same. <laughs> they don't sound the same. They're the same word. Um, so, uh, um, uh, right, Kant wanted to, this is one of a number of places, also in metaphysics, Kant wanted to reestablish certain uh, traditional Aristotelian, Aristotelian points, but on a completely new basis, right? Not like reinstituting Aristotelianism, but still like he wanted to get a, um, he, so he thought that both sides of this division had made a mistake. In some sense, he thinks they both made the same mistake. The mistake is called transcendental realism. <laughs> they both made the same mistake, but um, but of course they took it in two different diametrically opposed directions after they made that mistake. And so Kant divided his predecessors into rationalists and empiricists. Um, and it's not a bad division. Like I said, it really is an important thing that people disagree about. But even if it was a bad division, we would still use it for our courses because Kant was so influential, right? I mean, even, even though we might not know that that's why we were doing it. <laughs> that would be why we were doing it. Um, so, um, so that's why we have these two courses. Um, so after you take these two courses, you should really take 106, which, uh, which I think I'm teaching this course. So, well, maybe that means you should look at next year, but anyway. Um, um, so okay, so are there questions, more questions about that so far? So far, this is just, um, I don't know, bird's eye view of philosophical history. Okay, now I'm going to say more about the people who are actually going to review. So, um, yeah, seems like a lot of the time philosophical schools seem to have like a big three. <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, that's definitely true here, right? Like, there's a big three rationalists and a big three empiricists. Sometimes these days that gets expanded because, I mean, uh, although as I'm about to say, these people like were from all different places and spoke different languages and whatever, they were all they're all dead white men, right? So, like, um, uh, that's a reason to try to expand this. I haven't got to doing that in this course. I don't know if I will or not. As you'll see, it's very hard to fit this big three in for eight to 10 weeks. So it's a real, I don't know. Anyway, I haven't done it yet. So, um, so like, so anyway, these are the traditional, I think I once saw, saw an article, although now I can't find it again. 
I must be remembering the title wrong, but I think it was called Six Philosophers That Grew. <laughs> like it was about how these six people became the early modern philosophers. Um, right, so on the rational side, we have this Descartes, Spinoza, and Leibniz. And on the empiricist side, we have Locke, Barclay, and Hume. Berkeley, California is named after George Barclay, even though it's not pronounced. <laughs> um, in fact, I think I just found this out recently. It's actually the, the campus was first named Berkeley. And then the town was named after that. <laughs> uh, so, but anyway, so I tried to draw these people a little bit offset. Maybe I didn't do it enough. The, the, this were a little bit later than 100 people. Uh, Locke, in many ways, is responding to Descartes, right? They, um, they're not like simultaneously. Um, uh, and, you know, in fact, Spinoza had already died when Locke was in Amsterdam uh, before the revolution of 1688. So maybe I should have drawn it even farther down. <laughs> but um, in any case, it, yeah, Locke and Leibniz were contemporaries. Anyway, um, um, There are other people. I mean, I guess I should say maybe what am I trying to say? Even within the the traditional old time canon, there are other people who are missing from those from these two lists, like Hobbes, like Newton, right? Like important people. But like these are the people if you're going to divide it this way, <laughs> right? Like Hobbes, for example, does not really fit this classification very well. Um, so, um, um, so we're reading these three people, and there's one other thing to add about this. Well, there's probably there's a lot of other things to add about this. But um, one other thing I want to add about it now, which is that these people are usually called continental rationalists. And these people are called the British conspiracies. So, like, what's going on with that? I mean, so, like, at the time, I don't think, well, let me just say, so Descartes was French, and Spinoza was Dutch, and Leibniz was German. And I think they thought of themselves as French, Dutch, Ex Jewish Dutch, <laughs> they may, anyway, basically Dutch and German. They didn't really think of themselves as continental. Um, on this side, however, which is the case of our course, there is more of a feeling that British philosophy is its own thing. So, like, I guess there's two questions here. The, you know, one is, why? And the other question would be like, why does that thing end up being connected to empiricism? Um, so, um, you know, part of it is language, I think. So these people, these people all wrote in Latin and French. Um, Spinoza wrote a little bit in Dutch. 
That's the Spinoza that no one ever reads because no one knows Dutch. <laughs> Not true. Good friend of mine is Dutch. He reads Spinoza in Dutch, but uh, uh, Leibniz wrote very little in German, mostly, I think, correspondence. Almost everything they wrote was Latin and French. Um, whereas in Great Britain, very early, people started writing philosophy in English, right? Hobbes. Um, wrote some things in Latin, but he wrote, wrote his most influential work in English, Leviathan. Um, and from then on, I think basically all, all British philosophy was written in English. So these people really are, you know, somehow their own thing separate from whatever's going on over here. Um, but uh, You know, despite the fact that we call all these people British, but it's worth remembering that Locke was English and Hume was Scottish. And Barclay was really not British at all. He was Irish, right? When I say not British at all, right? Ireland is a different island from Britain. <laughs> um, now, I mean, it's this is kind of this kind of an aspirin to this Irish, however. Um, Barclays was uh, descended from a noble English family who was born in a castle in Ireland. Um, but, and so he was basically part of the English occupation of Ireland. Right, like the English nobility who ruled over Ireland. Um, so, you know, he's, I guess you could say, Anglo Ireland. And he spent a lot of his life in England and some in America, actually. We'll talk more about that when we get to Barclay. Um, so, um, but still, like this English Scottish division is. Um, is actually important. I mean, uh, right around and after this time, uh, Scottish philosophy and English philosophy actually diverged from each other. Right? There was one school of philosophy in England, the like associationist, um, and there was a different, this, the Scottish common sense philosophy was dominant in Scotland. So, like, um, they, for some purposes, these people really see themselves as having one, uh, don't want to say identity, because that word is going to give us lots of trouble later in the course. <laughs> but anyway, um, they, they do feel like they belong to a common philosophical realm or something, but there's also differences between them that um that we might not notice unless we pay attention. Hume actually wrote a history of England in six volumes. <laughs> is it seven volumes? Um, within in, during his own lifetime, he was most famous as a historian. Um, he made the most money, as he said in his autobiography from his history books. <laughs> um, so he wrote a history of England. It's really interesting to read that. Um, I mean, it's really interesting. And it, actually, it's a really good book worth reading, even though it's super long. <laughs> um, but it's interesting to read that because he treats the relationship between England and Scotland. And he, like, um, I think tries to remain neutral. <laughs> um, but he's well aware that he's Scottish and not English. All right. Anyway, um, that was something about why, like, why British philosophy, unlike continental philosophy, continental philosophy now means something else, but unlike continental rationalism, um, like these people, I, I think, do have some image of themselves as all in one area 
but I still haven't really answered why they tend to be empiricists. And I mean, of course, this is probably a case where I should take my own advice and say, we don't know. <laughs> but I, I think there are um, some, uh, some things you can say about why empiricism ended up dominating in Britain that um, during this period, because it, there wasn't necessarily true labor, but um, um, why it, it was distinctive of Britain in this period, I guess I should say, right? Like right after this period, empiricism was began to dominate in France. So it's not like empiricism was like, you know, innately British, but still, I think you can say some things and I think the things are worth saying, not not so much because I'm sure that the right explanation, because they actually point to things that we'll see in our text that we should pay attention to. So one is, I mean, they both basically have to do with pre-modern British thought, right? Like medieval British thought. So one is um, medieval nominalism. Um, and the main proponents of medieval nominalism, the most important ones, were you might not always hear him mentioned in this connection, but I think he should be. John Duff Scotus. He was Scottish, as you can tell from his name. <laughs> Um, he was not a very radical nominalist, but I think he started the nominalist trend, which then um, was, uh, I don't know, completed or taken farther by William of Ockham, right? Famous for Ockham's razor. <laughs> so, like, what Ockham, I don't think he called it a razor or anything, but. Um, but what Ockham really said that is called his razor is like we should not ent multiply entities without necessity. What does that mean? Well, so nominalism, um, and the opposite of nominalism is realism. And nominalism means um, like, you can ask about something. So like you most often hear this asked about universals, but I think for our purposes, it's more interesting to ask about individual qualities. Like here's a snowball. And by the way, I, the, the picture on the canvas site, I asked Dolly to, to draw like a schematic representation of a person perceiving a snowball. <laughs> so, like, here's a snowball, and the snowball is white. So, realism about that quality of whiteness would say that the snowball and the whiteness are two different things. So, here's the snowball, and here's the whiteness. Now, obviously, this picture is misleading because they're not two different things in two different places, right? No one would say that. Um, but still, somehow, um, there's a thing in the snowball that is its whiteness. And the Latin word for thing is this, which is what real comes from. Right? Real means like thing, thing away. So the realists about whiteness says that whiteness is a thing. The nominalist about whiteness says that there's really just one thing. And this thing can be called a snowball or it can be called white. It can be denominated white. 
So, I mean, like so far, the realist agrees, but the difference is the realist says the snowball can be called white because it has whiteness in it. And whiteness is a thing. The nominalist says there is no whiteness. Whiteness is a pure name, it's not the name of anything. So it's just a way of referring to this one thing, the snowball. Now, actually, this example is the one case where William of Ockham is not a novelist, right? About something like white, he's a realist. Right? But take the example of size, right? Like quantity. So William of Ockham is a nominalist about quantity. He says, and maybe when I give this example, you'll see why this seems kind of reasonable. There isn't a thing in the snowball that is its size. Right, the snowball is made up of parts that are in a certain arrangement to each, with respect to each other. And, you know, because of that, it, it has a size. But the size is different from the snowball. Um, the size is a way of calling attention to the snowball for certain purposes, something like that. And that's why we have a word. We have a name. We can call the snowball three inches in diameter. Um, but, um, but, but, uh, um, there's no such thing as three inches in diameter in this that's in the snowball and makes it that size. Okay, I mean, if you don't understand what the issue here is, first of all, if you don't understand what the issue here is, you might be right. Maybe this issue is nonsense. <laughs> A lot of people would say that, but uh, I don't tend to think they're right. But uh, but in any case, if, if you don't understand it, I mean, we're going to come back to different examples of this because although so nominalism is not the same as empiricism, obviously, right? I mean, these are this uh, it's really a different type of doctrine. But we'll see that um, especially Locke and Barclay, maybe also Hume, a little more complicated, but. Their empiricism actually has a lot of nominalism. A lot of it is based on, on understanding what kind of things there could be. Um, so, um, so it seems like this medieval nominalism, which, which I mean, I should say also, both of these people moved between Paris and Oxford and Paris. They didn't spend all their time, right? Like medieval philosophy was international, mostly just Oxford and Paris. Right? <laughs> Sometimes it went other places. But, um, um, but, you know, they were both British. Um, and I think nominalism, even in the Middle Ages, was thought of as distinctively British. So, um, so I think there's there's some connection there. I'll try to make that clearer when I actually get to talking about Locke and Berkeley and um, in what sense they're nominalists. Now, another thing is uh, I don't know exactly how to write this. I mean, okay, so so let me say this. So first of all, even before the Reformation in England, in the Middle Ages, there was a traditional tension between England and the, and, and the church in Rome. Now, I mean, that was true in a lot of places. I, like, I don't want to put too much emphasis on that because like the Holy Roman Empire fought a war against the, the Pope. And so, like, I mean, obviously there was plenty of opposition to the papacy in various parts of Europe. Um, 
but um, uh, but there was a particular tradition of that in Britain even before the Reformation. After the Reformation, um, um, so after the Reformation in England, England became the most important Protestant power. I mean, of course, there were like lots of Protestants in Germany and, and Holland and Switzerland or whatever, but England became, as opposed to France and Spain, which were the Catholic powers, right? So, um, um, so a lot of work in England went into like distinguishing themselves against the Catholics, and a particularly uh, Important but also really weird issue is the issue of transubstantiation. Seems like it should have two S's, but I think you write it with one S. All right. So transubstantiation. So transubstantiation means that um, in the Eucharist. Uh, the when the um, um, priests what, what's the right word blesses I'm not sure that's right sanctifies yeah anyway whatever the priest does during the Eucharist the 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 two species the bread and the wine um, are like before this happens, there's bread and wine there. And after it happens, there's the body of Christ. The entire body of Christ. Now, of course, it doesn't look like the body of Christ. <laughs> um, and that's part of how this is going to be related to empiricism. It doesn't look like the body of Christ. It still looks like a wafer and wine. But the entire body of Christ is there. You want to say the wafer becomes the body of Christ, but that's actually technically not correct, right? This isn't a pro transubstantiation; isn't the process of becoming. But like, never mind. So anyway, um, uh, this was a doctrine that, like, so when Henry VIII first took the Church of England uh, out of the Catholic Church. He actually remained really convinced that transubstantiation was 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 true. Henry VIII personally. So even though like a lot of the continent, the continental Protestants had already rejected it, in England you were supposed to believe in transubstantiation, and if you didn't, you could be burnt at the stake. And not only could you be, but people were. <laughs> like this actually happened. Um, then under his successor, which was Edward the Sixth or something, Edward the something, I don't know. Anyway, his successor like moved towards a more mainstream Protestant position and said, no, we don't believe in transubstantiation. Right? So what Protestants believe happens is, you know, depends on which one you ask, like you know, but but they all agree it's not transubstantiation, right? So um so uh, so then they started like burning people at the stake because they did believe in transubstantiation. And then Mary took over and um, uh, tried to bring England back into Catholicism. And then you could be burnt at the stake for not believing in transubstantiation. <laughs> and then Elizabeth took over and um, then switched the gap. There was a lot of burning at the stake and various other tortures and whatever. Um, and like informers, like provocateurs, like, you know, that transubstantiation stuff is kind of weird, isn't it? And you're like, yes. And then they'd report you to the, you know, like, anyway. So, um, um, so, but by the time these people write, wrote that, it all settled down. And it was clear that Anglicans were not supposed to believe in transubstantiation. It's one of the articles, the 39 articles of the Church of England. I think there was more controversy about it later, actually. But in this period, it was subtle. So, um, 
as I was starting to, to hint at, you know, like transubstantiation. So like the rationalists also had trouble, like, well, Spinoza didn't really care, uh, but Descartes and Leibniz both like had trouble with people saying, well, how can you account for what happens in the Eucharist? Um, but like, at least, you know, they have a fighting chance of doing it, even though there's problems of doing it in their system. But for like empiricism, um, when you say it still looks like a wafer and water, and it still feels like it, it smells like it, and like any way you can sense it. So according to empiricists, like it is a wafer and water. Sense is the, I already erased that, but sense is the only way we know about anything. So there's no chance of like correcting that somehow. This is actually exactly what Thomas Aquinas says when he's explaining why God is not deceptive in doing this. He says, um, um, that uh, it's not deceptive because our senses are corrected by reason, which is guided by faith. So, but if you're an empiricist, that can't happen. So, actually, if you want to be against transubstantiation, empiricism is a good is a good bet. <laughs> um, and like, I mean, you might think this is kind of an obscure point, and I think, like, it is to us. But it wasn't then, because, like, I mean, the burning at the stake had kind of come to an end, you know, thankfully, for this period, but it wasn't very long, <laughs> you know, and it wasn't very long ago that all of Europe was engulfed in wars over this, over issues like this, right? So, like, this was definitely on people's mind, and I think, you know, if you pay attention, you'll see all three of them at like um, opportune moments will get a dig in against transubstantiation, right? Like one of the most common examples they'll have of something that um, is absurd so that no one could really believe it, but that uh, you could like somehow get yourself to believe uh, by um, confusing yourself or something, is that one body could be in two places at the same time. Why are they picking that example? Because like, what if the mass is being celebrated in, in two different places at the same time? Then the entire body of Christ is here and the entire body of Christ is there. Right, so that's why they're picking that example. Um, Okay, so um, like I said, I don't know this. These, these two things separately or put together don't don't account for like why empiricism is British in this period. But I think they at least give some kind of clue as to what why there might be an affinity there. Um, I think that's everything I have to say in terms of general introduction. Are there questions about anything? Yes. Just quickly, is the distinction between the continental rationalist and British materials, is there like a through line back to like the, the analytic? No. There isn't, but uh, some people think there is, but <laughs> it's mythology, right? Like in between everything was mixed up. Like alienism was dominant in England, and no. Okay. <laughs> All right. Oh. Okay, bye everyone out there. <laughs>